The Cellcast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cellcast. Joining me today is a man who, uh, well, he got lost in a hole in the middle of a swamp looking for a diamond. Welcome, Jacob. Man, that took a long time to get out of that hole. <laughs> and you just barely made it out before you got uh, dunked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> baptized, we could say. Yeah, baptized in some dirty water. Let's yeah, see some very dirty water. <laughs> All right. Why, well, thank you. And let me get into our co-host. A man who just went down to the bayou and some, some gator soup and looking for some diamonds. Welcome, Drew. I keep forgetting you actually are from Louisiana. Or you have I have, fa- in I have roots in Louisiana. I don't think you're yes. roots in Louisiana. You're not actually yes. from Louisiana. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. You're a, from here. Yeah, I'm, fr- I'm from Texas. Right. I do forget that from time to time. <laughs> Next thing you're going to tell me, you went gator hunting down on the down on the, uh, the Atchafalaya. No, that was my uncle. <laughs> no, seriously, he did. <laughs> I watched Gator people. I I know, I know at least a outlook on how that goes. I will admit that's probably not a completely truthful show because, like all reality TV, it's dramatized to some. Oh, degree. completely, completely. But but either, uh, at, yeah. at the same time, I you just gotta love that 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 main guy on that show when they're down there on the bayou and he's got uh, that girl, that, the girl Elizabeth down there and he goes, true to produce booth. <laughs> you can hardly make out a word he says anyway. Right. I think even the people who would live in Louisiana around that area would have a hard time making out what he's saying. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. But anyway. Yes. Uh, getting into this week's trivia. Of course, we are reviewing uh, 1977's The Rescuers, if you couldn't tell that from the thing. And the trivia question this week was, The Rescuers is the first Disney movie to have what? Jacob? Oh. What is the answer to this well, conundrum? Well, in, 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 in all the editions that are currently out, currently, this was deleted. <laughs> nope, that's not the answer. But I'm getting to that. Oh, you're getting to that. Yeah. I'm getting to that. In fact, uh, John, this was actually John Haru's guess of yeah. uh, playing game. The DM on playing games with strangers. Yeah. Uh, he, he, there is a scene in New, in the New York chase where, uh, for a split second, on the VHS, mm-hmm. there was a picture of a naked woman. Yes. Split second, it has since been edited out. So yes. it is. this movie is still good for kids to watch. Yes. And probably it would have gone by too fast on the VHS for most people to catch anyway, unless you really were going frame by frame, which, anyway. Or as well, we, what me and my brothers would have called slow-mo death cam back in the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but John Har, you did guess that. I had some, that, that technically, as far as I know... That is the first time that showed up in a Disney movie. Ah, if you don't count the uh, the uh, some of the characters in Fantasia, that is true. But that was not the answer that I was looking for. Ah, okay. You want to have another guess? Hmm. Does it have anything with nudity? I already mentioned the nudity. Okay, then what, that wasn't what I was looking for. Okay, what are you looking for then? Well, if you don't know. I don't know. Well, let me go through the rest of the answers that people tried to answer. All right, go for it. So Josh Adams, who is currently in our chat, he said it was the first movie to combine the talents of the original Walt Disney crew with the new talent hired in the mid-70s. I don't think so. Well, it was... Technically, yes. Yes. Maybe. But I don't... That's not really... They're always going to have people moving in and out, because, I mean, it's a company. So that wasn't quite what I was going with. Uh, Dallas of Geek Devotions said Cruella DeVille prototype. Technically not a prototype, considering Cruella DeVille predates this. I don't exactly remember when 101 Dalmatians came out, but I do believe Walt Disney worked on it. Mm-hmm. No, oh, hold on. The, car- the, the man, he was involved. But I could have my dates wrong. 
But from other things I read, 101 Dalmatians does predate this. As we wait on Jacob to get the, uh, to double check me, I, my answer here. That's, okay. Mm. Almost, maybe. 1961. 1961. So yeah, 101 Dalmatians predate this, so this technically can't be a prototype of Cruella de Vil. Yes. But uh, Heather Morgan and Kevin Joshua Burnham both got it right. That's uh, the Dapper Man, by the way. Kevin ah, okay. Uh, he's also on uh, the bottom shelf with uh, John Haru and Dallas. Oh, okay. That podcast. They both got the answer correct with the first movie to have a direct sequel. That is true. It is the first Disney movie to have a direct sequel. The Rescue is Down Under. <laughs> Indeed. All the other ones that came after this are, A, done by Disney Toon and not Walt Disney Animation Studios until you get to Frozen 2, I believe. Huh. No, no, Winnie the Pooh. There's a Winnie the Pooh movie that came out after Tangled that everybody forgets about. Oh, okay. That we will eventually have to watch because it's actually like the last 2D Disney movie. Oh, okay. Interesting. But yeah. But yeah. Uh, all the other ones up until... I think that's that's the last yeah those those are all done by Disney Toon so this is it's a, a direct in line and direct sequel done by Walt Disney Animation Studios is yeah. a rarity is what I'm trying to yeah. get at so uh, yeah that's that Jacob how are you doing this week man I'm doing very well now there that are... I've gotten tangled on my words yes <laughs> <laughs> it's all knots. <laughs> It's a tongue twister. <laughs> well, at least you're not Jar Jar from episode one. <laughs> Me, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Either way. So, yeah, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a little bit of an episode on Friday. Uh, I, had a, I had a severe Tourette's attack on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was probably the worst I've ever had in years, decades. And uh, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, your body is just convulsing. You can't do anything about it. And you're sitting there praying, oh my gosh, this is a stop. Because <laughs> at the point you're pointed tears because it just hurts so much. But uh, finally relieved, probably around eight, 8 in the morning. I, I called in before that, so I didn't work that day. So I had a good solid three-day weekend. Now, granted, Friday was more like, oh my gosh, I can't move. <laughs> but yeah, thank you again to everybody who reached out. And uh, just you know, for your, your prayers, your thoughts, your uh, encouragement in a lot of ways. And I thought it was a very poignant time to, because uh, I use Young Living Oils for to mm -hmm. combat my Tourette's disorder. Um, so I I posted if the guys the, those who uh, post or uh, who like that that post, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's it's always great when you have a, a good community of friends and friends and people you know and family. Friends that, and friends. Friends and friends. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but either way, so yeah, thank you guys so much for that. Uh, other than that, it's been pretty good. The uh, weekend was productive for the most part. Uh, Monday was interesting. Uh, I won't get into all the details. It was uh, I have a sack or a, 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 a fellow employee who likes to pick on people, and so no, he, no. I mean like people like to pick on people. No, like no, it's a new phenomenon. Have you never heard of it? If I were to say no, this would be the pot <laughs> calling the kettle black. And I'm not about to do that. Right. But either way, um, Michael loves to pick on people. I'm just calling him Michael. This is by his first name. So Michael was just like, I'm, I'm standing behind my register. And I feel Michael go to do something in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. So I literally just do a down block with my left hand. And... When no picking I, for you. Yeah, I literally strike his hand, and his hand goes somewhere and causes him to fall to the ground in pain. Yeah. You I, are a mean person. <laughs> I, I am not a mean person because I didn't intend it that way. It's just the way the block went. He literally hit himself. <laughs> So there again, well, Michael, I do apologize, but that was just be like, I'm, you had to come in, buddy. I'm going to assume then that he learned his lesson. I hope. <laughs> but either On way. the next episode. <laughs> well, he did it again. I'm beginning to think he likes it. 
Oh my gosh. But so either way, either way. So that, that's, that was an interesting day. I'm not going to go into all the detail because it's, you know, work drama and the whole bit. You don't want to hear that. But overall it was a good day. Yet today was a very good day. I got home and started doing my notes and I'll get into what I'm watching while I was doing my notes. But when we get into what we're watching, but overall, very good, very good uh, part weekend and week. So, yeah, that's, what, that's how everything is going. How about you, Drew? I had a good weekend. Okay. Uh, it was a very busy mm-hmm. weekend. It was a very cold Saturday morning. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but other than that, it was, it was, it was, it was an all right, all right week. Uh, before we get into what we've been watching, yeah, I, I do want to stop you right there because I'm we're, get, we're getting one thing that happened yesterday. Something to do with Valentine's Day? You mean Singles Awareness Day? <laughs> Something like that. So uh, there again, guys. Uh, happy late Valentine's Day for everybody and those who are single, like us two blokes. Yeah. Happy Singles Awareness Day. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, continue. I was going to let you continue speaking because of the two of us, you're the only person here who can talk about the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. So that's your right. thoughts on that before oh, you get into what we've been watching. Oh, my gosh. Yes. The the Cincinnati Bengals versus the LA Rams. That was a great game. It was very much, it was neck and neck. It was like the, the Bengals are ahead, fourth quarter. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Because the Bengals had, they'd gone to Super Bowl many, many moons ago, like two or three decades ago, and they lost. And it was like, okay, maybe it's maybe it's their time. Maybe it's their time. And they came so close. I'm talking probably two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. The, uh, the Rams get on the board with like, like, ahead of three and it's just like oh this and everyone's like game's over man game over man to quote aliens but um it's just like they the they scored the Bengals get the ball and i think they just kind of they choked they choked a little bit and that's just lost in the game and I was like, it was a great game it was a lot of fun definitely watching some of the trailers that came out with definitely Doctor Doctor Strange uh, that was an interesting trailer. Mm-hmm. Minus we were watching over kind of like a our like a Roku, so the the signal was hit and miss. But um, overall, great game. I loved it. Love that game. Death was so much fun. And uh, so yeah, that's another thing I watched. <laughs> is that is that all you watched? No, I actually watched a lot. Actually, so continue. All right, all right, good deal. Uh, so. Like I said before, uh, I start. I watched a certain uh, movie uh, making of movie documentary we reacted to back in late 2019 or mm-hmm. late 2019 in the no late 2000 yeah late 2019 which would be Frozen two. And, uh, yeah, I, that would have been late 2019. Yeah, j- just before the, the COVID uh, pandemic hit. Before we were even aware that such a thing existed. Agreed. So, I finally finished watching this. this I think it was like a six to nine part thing on Disney+. Plus, and it took me, you know, <laughs> quite a time to get through it. And uh, it's like, wow. Like, now I really want to get back and start listening back to those those songs and watch it again because it just made you want to rewatch it and just kind of re- reassess your view on that film. And uh, But other, other than that, I'd be like, I watched uh, like a ton of documentaries like I normally do because I'm a history nut. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now I'm watching um, National Geographic's Drain the Ocean, which is a fascinating series in which they, they, they find sunken shipwrecks and planes or whatever. And they investigate the, like the whole scene. It's really really cool. Uh, I started watching a show that has been mentioned on this show before, and I watched its uh, its predecessor. I think I watched like one episode of its predecessor. Okay, that came well, it came out like the like the uh, the early nineties. And what I'm referring to, watch the first four episodes of Sailor Moon Crystal. I won't ah. I won't go into the entire title. It's like that's the full title of the show. <laughs> 
But either way, I watched it on Hulu, and uh, that was that was interesting. I'm not exactly sure this is a show for me, but I gave it a shot, and I, I might watch one or two more episodes to see where it goes. But yeah, so I watched that, and let me get back to my notes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oddly enough, we both watched the same movie at the exact same time, and it uh, wasn't planned. <laughs> completely unplanned. Completely unplanned. So what I'm referring to, if, if uh, for those who don't follow me on Facebook, uh, I want to go watch. So the... let's start this from the beginning. Okay. For those of you who don't know about this, on our Patreon, mm -hmm. we have been reviewing some live action movies. We've mm -hmm. done two so far. Mm -hmm. And... While we were both looking forward to Death on the Nile, yes, which is the movie in question, uh, we were planning on we're either I think we're reviewing it later this week to go mm. up there. But anyway, uh, we still needed to watch the movie. Well, yeah. I was meeting my parents in town. Mm -hmm. We decided to meet at the restaurant at you know twelve thirty. So I get out of here at you know eleven thirty. Make sure I had plenty of time to get there. Yeah. And uh, let's just say I was halfway there <laughs> and driving through this little town called Bullard. I go, hey, you know, these raindrops are starting to look a little like snow. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Of course, it's 38 degrees. It's not going to stick. So I continue. I get, if you know Tyler, I get to Broadway and Grande and it is a literal blizzard. Yeah, literally. It's like, good night. I have never seen it snow like this, ever. It didn't snow like that it's during Snowpocalypse. Barely. It was like huge flakes. Like, mm -hmm. it, it was like someone was, you know, I know they call, call it like, uh, it was like someone was shaking out flour. Yeah. It's kind of how it looked to me. Um, I forgot to hit that button. Uh brain fart uh <laughs> so I, we get there we're eating dinner i but, but when i got there i texted you because you had just texted me the uh album art for mm -hmm. our uh rumble episode yes and i texted you back saying yeah i'll upload that when i get home from the movie and i sent you a picture of what it looked like out front of the uh the restaurant yeah and apparently you misunderstood. <laughs> of course. <laughs> apparently. Because you thought we were already gone to see the movie and were eating dinner before we came home. Yes. No, that's not what we did. All right. So, so I drive over to the movie theater because we took separate, me and my parents took separate cars over there. So we could just leave from there and go our separate ways. And uh, I get parked and I start walking towards the front of the building when all of a sudden. I see a car driving up. I'm thinking, no, the car, car looks familiar. Huh, huh. It kind of looks like, oh, my word. <laughs> what the crud is he doing here? Exactly. So there was no reason in my mind that you would have a need to come to Tyler. Because in my mind, the local movie theater should have been playing the movie. Which they but didn't. it's not. <laughs> so from my story, from my end of the story, so I get the text from Drew. It's like, oh, okay, and my assumption is, oh, they've just finished the film and they're eating dinner. So I leave for I leave for Tyler and I get bombarded by this snowstorm. Yeah. This blizzard which you was by the way, described. none of it stuck. None of Absolutely it. Absolutely none of it. <laughs> but it was very pretty to watch. Yes. So I drive the I drive to, to drive Tyler. Through. Drive to Tyler, pull into the uh the theater parking lot, and then I see this man walk up like, what in the world are you doing here? So, so and then it's like, oh, okay. So we get the, the confusion. It's like, oh, yeah. okay. So you're so, here to watch the movie too, aren't yeah. you? I'm thinking, well, there's only one showing you could be going to. That is true. So I walk in, I walk in the theater. I haven't bought, there. haven't bought my tickets yet. So get in. I'm talking with Drew, talking with his mother, talking with his dad uh -huh. and uh, get my tickets. And it's like, oh, okay. It's like, wait. Got perfect seats. There's one, two, three. Huh. You just buy hey, the ticket next to me. I buy the ticket next to him. It's like, wait, be like, like so-and-so row, right? It's like, yeah, click. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> because me and my mom had a rule. If you can get into row I at that theater, yeah. that's the row you get into. Right. If you, Especially if it's in the center. If you can't get I, go to H or go to, was it J that's next to the other one? Mm-hmm. The other direction? Yeah, H-I-J. Yeah. Sorry, I had to actually think my alphabet there for a minute. <laughs> And uh, that's what we've always done. So Mama bought the tickets because it was her turn. Mm-hmm. And uh, sitting there going, and, and, and Jacob's right, right there next to me. I'm like, this is the most awkward situation I think I've ever been in. Not awkward in that, oh, my friend happened to show up because that kind of happens. But, you know, we spend entirely too much time together as it is. <laughs> that is true. Between the podcast and Bible study <laughs> and the fact that we just have a lot of things in common we happen to do. Right. So there's, I had this weird thought in my mind. It's like, no, don't go there. <laughs> not go there. But anyway, I'm not going to even tell you what it is. Okay, good. Because you probably already have a good claim. But anyway, that was a good movie, by the way. That was a very good movie. I, I will say, it is, it is a mystery, and I'm not going to spoil anything about the movie. Right. But I had, fairly quickly, I would say even before the murder yeah. actually happened. Yeah, I, I was I was along. I think I fairly knew who the murderer was going to be. But throughout the movie, I began to question mm-hmm. it. Because of just the way it's set up. I don't want to go into it more than that. Yeah. If you want to know more of our thoughts, join us on our Patreon. You can find it over at patreon.com slash the cellcast. Pay us some money. You'll have the new episode probably later this week. Yeah. Probably. On Death on the Nile. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, continue. <laughs> no, I thought that was very, it was very, as I, I, I described it, it as ironic and a friend of ours, Chase, that ironically... <laughs> Yeah, because he yes. didn't get it. He no. didn't realize we did not plan to no, meet at this the movie was theater. Not planned not whatsoever. Planned in the slightest. Yeah, because for me, I was thinking like, oh, okay, I can go to this theater and go to this theater. It's like, well, Drew's always you know hyping up this theater. It's like, yes, oh, why not? Because it's the best theater in town. And Tyler, if you're going to Tyler, you go to these other. I'm not gonna advertise for them, so right. don't get your hopes up. But of the four movie theaters in Tyler. Mm-hmm. To me, this is the best one. Yeah. It's not overpriced. Like, there's like very few commercials and it's fairly close. Yeah. To me. The other theater's close. One of the theaters is closer to my right. mom, but that theater we I have issues with on a uh, cleanliness level. I gotcha. I have issues with it on a cleanliness uh, level. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Just putting gotcha. that out there. I gotcha. So a funny part of that viewing... So we the like the the climax of the movie is done the 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 big secret's been revealed and so and the literally the movie is literally in its ending shots it's they're in a bar some jazz is playing it's zooming out from Poirot spoilers Poirot survives <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a spoiler and all of a sudden we get it just starts stuttering yeah. like the, the, constantly the, 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 like, oh, this is odd, odd. I have. <laughs> I have only been in the theater one other time yeah. when it screwed up like that. Now, it wasn't exactly like that. It literally just froze at one point. And it was when I went to see Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. Yeah. It's an okay movie. I say it's an okay movie. Some people absolutely hate it. Mm. But there's this scene in the middle of the movie where... I think her name is Aqua or Bubbles or something to that effect. Okay. She's singing this. She's an alien. Yeah. She's singing this kind of operatic thing. And while Valerian is escaping, mm-hmm. get right down to it. And she goes and hits that, you know, that very operatic high note. And it starts stuttering there for about a good two or three minutes. And it just freezes. <laughs> and it's like, I don't think that's correct. Had to go out and talk to the people at the concession. Says, "Hey, uh, the projector and auditorium, something or other, is messed up. Y'all may need to go fix it." But and I haven't had an issue with this sort of thing since then. Mm-hmm. I mean, the only other issues we can talk about is the fact that the sound mix was bad for the first couple months down there at the one in town. Oh yes, but 
they got that fixed. Yeah. But uh, not that that made Star Wars any better. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> but we're sitting there, and it's and we're sitting there long enough, we start real. I, I start realizing that there's a pattern to, yeah. to the stuttering. <laughs> And it's pretty much any time that it, the processor had to do any sort of thinking for any reason, it would just slow very all. It, it would just kind of go the mute sound would, and that's why it took so long to get out of that one scene. This last you know, or you know, image all the way across the screen, and then you get to the credits, and. When there'd be when the screen would be mostly black, you know, between it would be running smooth like it's supposed to, and then all of a sudden, directed by so and so, and it kept doing that, and it got, and, and you know, it. Marvel has taught me never to leave a movie theater till I see the MPAA logo. Yeah, so I'm still sitting there watching this thing, and you get to the uh, the special effects credits you know where there's like and it literally a, stops a me. mound of names uh-huh. and it's just like like a full second between things like because it's having such a hard time processing the amount of image on the screen it's like this is hilarious and sad <laughs> <laughs> i do have the same one thing about really that. hope next time i go to that theater that's not a problem <laughs> yeah so i do have to say this Apparently, the projector at this certain theater was having a Tourette's attack. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was a fun viewing of a film. I'm curious if they actually had to shut that auditorium down for a while because that seemed like it was more than just a reboot might fix. Yeah, but I could be wrong. It yeah. could have just been an, a reboot because who knows how long those projectors stay on. That is true. I don't know if they turn them off at night. Uh, I'm sure they're supposed to turn them off at night. Oh, yeah. But let's face it. These places are run by high schoolers. True. So who knows? That is true. All right. Anyway. Anything else you've been watching? Uh, No. So besides Death on the Nile, I, you went to go watch the Super Bowl, of course. Yes. I did not. Hmm. Because as I'm sure you... Maybe you can't understand because of how much of a football nut you are. I, I had no interest. Uh, and uh, my our friend Chase, who uh, may be in the Facebook, I don't know, he also had no interest in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And we real and there was uh, two other of our friends, Thomas and Hez- Hezzy. Oh gosh. <laughs> Uh, decided to go and come over. I don't know why. Tom, I, I think Thomas said the reason he wasn't interested in the Super Bowl was because his team wasn't playing. Uh, and I just don't think Hezzy cares yeah. about football. So he yeah. came, or he was mostly there to hang out with Thomas. Yeah. And uh, we watched a movie that all of us had decided we needed to wait on Thomas to watch again. Mm. Pro Mayor. <laughs> oh my <laughs> word! <laughs> First off. Go watch Promare. Yeah. We reviewed it. Over, and then listen to our review. Yes. You'll, my thoughts have not changed. Uh, but watching that with Thomas was interesting because he's actually, you can tell he's paying attention because <laughs> he's like reacting to everything else everyone else is reacting to. And that movie is just such a joy to watch. Agreed. You it get is. right down it to is. it. But, oh man, that is a fun movie. <laughs> We had a good time, and then we watched like uh, we watched one episode of Ghost in the Shell because of all people, Hezekiah asked, "What's Ghost in the Shell?" Oh, and it was, <laughs> we watched stand the well, first episode of Standalone, standalone. Complex. Yeah, because if you're going to really, if you're really going to introduce someone and you don't want to go, you know, head trippy on them, yeah, you go with Standalone Complex. Yeah, in which you do <laughs> not give th- show them the movie that we reviewed. Yeah. In which you want to listen to our review, go of, at it. Of the movie. Yeah, of the movie, not Standalone Complex. And not the Scarlett Johansson movie either. No. The original movie, which is still a brain trip. Yes, but, agreed. Uh, we watched that, and then we watched two episodes of a uh, series called Goku Sen. Okay. It is a story about a female school teacher in a Japanese high school that is all boys. Hmm. But she is from a Yakuza family. Oh, okay. 
And if she ever, if the school, of course, ever finds out, she would be fired because shady history and uh, mm -hmm. you know with the yakuza and all that. She's not just from a yakuza family; she's the acting head of the yakuza family. Okay, and uh, <laughs> that movie was funny as all get out. Mm. Uh, sorry, that show. So uh, I will, if you can find that, I suggest giving that a shot. All right. Uh, other than that, what did I watch? Oh, uh, I watched the sequel to the movie we're reviewing tonight. I watched Rescuers Down Under. I did too. Been, I forgot that. It had been quite a while. I'm just going to say Down Under is better, but do not oh. let that color your oh. my, my thoughts yeah, on the actual it's, it's very hard not to. Yeah, it's very hard not to like Down Under better. <laughs> Because it's newer, and it's got George C. Scott in one of my favorite villain roles of all time. Mm -hmm. But more on that whenever we get to that episode. Like we exactly. say a lot of times, we'll get there when we get there. Mm -hmm. But uh, So I watched that, and uh, other than that, I haven't watched much of anything. I did uh, continue playing uh, Dragon Quest XI mm -hmm. last night on the stream. Yeah. I am now finally to the part of Dragon Quest XI where I stopped last time. Okay. I am now entering into the blind portion of my playthrough for the stream. So literally, I am lost in a frozen wood. Oh, fun. In the area around Sniffleheim. Okay. I have no idea what Sniffleheim is. Sniffleheim? As in... Yeah. Sniffle. This, movie, this game is full of puns, by the way. Oh, uh, okay. I gathered. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm in... Sn I'm... Just left Sniffleheim, and I am heading towards an area I actually can't pronounce the name of. Not because it's bad, it's just because literally it's got one of those odd characters that we don't normally think of being a part of the English language because it's not in the alphabet song, but it is in there. Okay. <laughs> and I, because I think it's Scandinavian or something. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce the word. I think it's like Scar Scarfelt or something to that effect is the name of it. But anyway, so I'm playing through that. I did stream Mario Kart a eight deluxe the other night for a couple of streamers for a couple of people in our stream we played that i my plan was to try and get gold on 200 all 200 cc tracks i did not do this mm. because i got angry at the game okay and decided instead of making a fool of myself to switch to online and play against people and have fun there we go that seemed like the better choice and uh, of course I'm still playing 14 and uh I'm going to throw in the, a weird one in there that we don't normally talk about. You know, being podcasters, we listen to podcasts. Yeah. And I found a new podcast to listen to this week. It is a recording of an audio drama, a fan production of an audio drama. Really? Yes. Power Rangers, the audio drama. Okay. It is not an exact retelling of Mighty Morphin. There are a lot of changes. Okay. It, they It's like they took original Mighty Morphin season one, the comics that have come out from Boom Studios recently, mm -hmm. and the original Sentai series, uh, Geo Ranger. Okay. Threw them in a blender, mixed them up, and put them out, and put them out on the internet. And I'm enjoying the fool out of it. It is dark. I will give you that warning. Okay. Is it is dark? Um, let's just say how they deal with Tommy's brainwashing is not pleasant. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's just say that. But I am enjoying the thing. I am enjoying the show now. I am in the middle of season two, which is technically the the Lord Zed season. Yeah, I'm not happy with what they're doing with some of the characters, but. You know, stuff like that happens in a fallen world. Okay. But I am enjoying that. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I've been listening to Power Rangers, the audio drama. So that's what it's called. Power Rangers, the audio drama. Yes. Okay. And I'm looking at that right now. <laughs> I figured you would. Uh, but other than that, I think that is all I've been watching, playing, and listening to. Alrighty. Here, let me see if I can give you a quick hand so you know what it looks like. Yep. Already got it. Yep. That's it. All right. So I think that brings us to the end of what we've been watching. So why don't we get into the news? Yeah, let's get into the news. All right. So this news just dropped today. 
just like just this morning, Disney Plus, Disney, Walt Disney Company well, just dropped it. They did yesterday release a teaser that said in 24 hours, the new trailer for this movie was going to be yes. released. I didn't catch that one, but... I did see it, but I didn't think to post it, so... Okay. I posted the trailer as soon as I saw it. Right. Oddly enough, I saw the poster first. Because right. one of our listeners, Heather Morgan, tags me like every day in something, you know, animated really. So thank you again, Heather, for that. I found it through a page on another thing and I couldn't get to where, where, where I saw. I saw that it was posted, but I went to YouTube to actually watch the thing. So, okay. All right. So today on February 5th, 2022, Disney Plus released the first trailer and new poster for the original movie, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, a comeback 30 years in the making, a hybrid live action animated action comedy caught up with catches up with the former Disney afternoon stars in a modern day Los Angeles premiering May 20th, 2022 exclusively on Disney Plus. Boy, is that an original uh, concept? Yes. So kind I, of, kind of. So I, so I do want to, you know, pick your brain for just a second about this. So after watching the trailer, what was your like initial thoughts? I was confused at first because that starts off, yeah, and it's showing you. I actually thought I was looking at a YouTube ad. Okay. The first couple of seconds, because it was starting off like, you know, or maybe I actually didn't think, I, I thought maybe the link I found was the, not the YouTube ad, not YouTube ad, but like one of those things that repost the trailer, but they have their own little logo thing in front before the actual trailer starts. Yeah. Because you know that those, those are out there and it starts going into this real Hollywood true life story of Chip and Dale rescue Rangers. And I'm going, this is an interesting take yeah. on this. And I'm watching it, and you st- they literally tell you this is a Roger Rabbit type thing by showing you Roger Your Rabbit. Rabbit. And, like, and just the okay. thing, just the thing for three seconds, they have not, like, Roger Rabbit, like, in general, has not been used by the Walt Disney Company in a, in a, in a, in a oh, motion. It gets better. Oh, it does. Because it's, there's non Disney stuff in this trailer. Yeah. Which was like, how did you get the... You people were talking to Hasbro. Yeah. Because I saw ponies. <laughs> For really? five seconds, I saw ponies. <laughs> and not some uber realist... Not, I don't mean actual ponies. I mean my little ponies. The vectors from Gen 4. I don't know if it was the same ones because they weren't on screen long enough for me to recognize anybody. Wow. <laughs> because I have seen too much of that amongst everything. But... <laughs> It's like, okay, let's talk about the fact one's 2D and one's 3D, because that's still throwing me for a loop. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I've, I've, Chip is 2D. Dale, Dale had is... apparently the su- surgery to make himself 3D. 3D. <laughs> of course he would, because he's like, Yeah, that would be Dale, but it's like, huh. Oh, my gosh. Interesting. <laughs> yes, I would agree with you. And just give me one moment. I want oh, to you're find, fine, dude. I want to find a uh, comment which someone posted. I thought it was just very poignant to our review of this film or the the reaction. It was very according to this. We 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 posted the trailer and we posted the uh, the uh, the poster. Yeah. And one of the one of the people were uh, reacted saying to it. It's like this is so meta, and it is. Yeah. I'm like, but just, I'm getting. My problem is I'm getting tired of meta. Yeah, I would agree. It, it was it, Roger Rabbit is one thing. Yes, because that was novelty at the time. Yes. Uh, Space Jam was another thing because that was mixing not not Space Jam: A New Legacy, the original Space yeah. Jam. Uh, pff, what is the name of that movie? Uh, Ready Player One. Yeah. That was one I was like expecting. Okay, you got to go meta with this because that's ninety percent of the story. Exactly. Space Jam: A New Legacy comes out, and I'm going, "Why? Why did you do this? <laughs> this was unnecessary, and you ad- added nothing to the story. Not that there was much story to begin with, but that's beside the point." Uh, and then we get to what is it more recently? Well, yet yeah, Spider-Man: No Way Home. Yeah. Which is like, okay, you, that's how you do it right. But they also didn't go overboard. There's been some other stuff that's 
done the whole let's pull in everything from everywhere that we have rights to. I can't think of the name of it right now. Yeah. Um, and some video games are doing that now. Yeah. And I now agree. we're getting it with Chippendale Rescue Rangers. And I'm still sitting there going, because there's a line in the, the beginning of that trailer that still sticks out. It's like, well, that's utterly wrong. Because it says, how did the, it says, how did this one show, referring to the original Rescue Rangers, yes. uh, catapult these no-name chipmunks into being household names? And I'm sitting there going, no. They were Chip and Dale existed long before Rescue Rangers and were household names long before that because they were giving Pluto a hard time back in the 40s. Including Donald Duck. And Donald Duck. Yeah. They've been around a while. Wreck-It Ralph. Thank you, PaulJPowers.com. But it kind of works in the original Wreck-It Ralph. Doesn't yeah. quite work so well in Ralph Breaks the Internet. Mm. But, yeah, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. So, yeah, let us know what your thoughts of for the trailer for Chippendale Rescue Rangers coming to Disney Plus on. I'm actually intrigued by this because there are a lot of animation jokes. Oh, yeah. In the film. I mean, when they go to when they go to that one area, where where are we? It's like, you remember that time when they were making uber real, uh, ultra realistic graphics? Yeah. uh, ultra realistic oh yeah that was hilarious uh, and it, and it did, people didn't like it and go yeah and they got this and, and they do the whole thing it was like who are you looking who are you talking to i'm talking to you it looks like you're talking to that window over there well it looks like i'm talking to you <laughs> it's like i hate this and yet it's still I good love it. it's... i actually it's one of those movies like i'm probably not gonna like this movie i still kind of want to see it exactly <laughs> So there again, if you have watched the trailer, please let us know what you thought of it. Did you like it? Did you just like it? Did you catch anything that we haven't caught yet? So please comment down below or comment down in our social media feeds and uh, get a conversation started about this movie. If you're excited about it coming out in May, May 20th. Yeah, May 20th on Disney+. Plus. Uh, please let us know and you never know. We might do a reaction to it. Maybe. PaulJPowers.com says he hated it. Oh, really? <laughs> he would be more open if they had kept the original voices. Oh, yeah. I would agree with you on that. I can agree with that. Yeah. But I, was... I suspect that cameo by Scrooge McDuck cannot be done by um, the original voice actor whose name is escaping me right now. Yes. Because he's dead. <laughs> yes. They'll just have uh, Dave Tennant come in. He's the one doing it for the new show. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Anyways. So going into, uh, there was a movie you mentioned. Yeah. You mentioned space jam earlier. Mm -hmm. So this kind of ties in with the next, uh, bit of kind of sad news that came out of, uh, the Hollywood world right now. Uh, writer, director, and producer Ivan Reitman, uh, passed away on February 16th, Mm -hmm. February 12th at the age of 75. Uh, Ivan Reitman is well known, well known for his um, his comedies, his horrors, but primarily for Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters Two. And also, he I think he co produced um, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and that's a phenomenal film. If you haven't watched, it, go check it out. I still need to watch it. It is. Uh, I can let you borrow my copy if you want if you want to, but. That is. This is a really weird world when I know it just came out in theaters like a week or two ago. And it's already on home video. Yeah. Go back in the day, this like when Jurassic weird. when Jurassic Park came out, it took a year and a half to come on VHS. Uh, VHS. Just saying. Now it takes like a month because <laughs> it takes nothing to copy and paste and then press with a machine. It took a long time to actually do or, or record everything via magnetic tape. That is true. All right. But anyway, so. Besides doing the classic Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2, uh, Ivan Reitman uh, was also known as a producer for the 1981 adult animated anthology film of Heavy Metal. And uh, that'll get to more news on that movie. Heavy Metal, I remember us watching that. (laughs) Hmm? We watched that. Heavy Metal? I think if if I'm thinking right, didn't we watch that over at Chase's? No, that was Rock and Roll. That's true. Never mind. Yeah. That was Rock and Roll. I've not that seen Heavy Metal yet. I've or Heavy Metal 2000. Either. Rock and Roll was a weird movie. That was a weird movie. <laughs> we will definitely have to review that one at some point. Uh, just because it's weird. <laughs> uh, 
So he also was a producer on the 90s hybrid classic Space Jam, which we've also done a review with our buddy Aaron. Yes. And uh, we did a reaction to its sequel, which also he was an exclusive producer of last year, 2021 sequel, Space Jam A New Legacy. So yeah, Ivan Reitman, Ivan Reitman has sadly passed away. And uh, he leaves a very large legacy behind him in the world of animation and beyond. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of a a nice, a bad shot in the arm. Definitely, if you're a movie lover or an animation lover, and also he went out, he did I think Mummies Alive and like a bunch of other cartoons that came out in the nineties. I could see that. Yeah, he was a bit like he was prolific in everything. Uh, so speaking of heavy metal, uh, the landmark eighties animation film. Uh, heavy metal from 1981 is returned to the to uh, the shelves for its first ever 4K Ultra HD set uh, to be in a limited steel box, featuring new surround sound, including being produced by Evan Reitman. Uh, apparently, this this conversion was actually one of Ivan Reitman's last thing he did, which is like okay, that's awesome. Um, It'll arrive on. It'll arrive in, th- in arrive in theaters. It'll arrive in uh, your stores or on demand wherever you're going to get it. Uh, April nineteenth mm-hmm. uh, through Sony Pictures Home Entertainment, and it'll be packaged in Blu-ray along with um, uh, Heavy Metal Two Thousand. Okay. So I think I I know little about Heavy Metal. I know Heavy Metal was a Com- it was a magazine for years, years and years ago, but I think it'd be interesting to watch that film to see what kind of be like what this whole thing's about. So either way, so that is all the news I have. For- uh, Josh in our chat would like to know: Is the steel book heavy? It might have a little lead in it. Okay. Yeah, so that's all I have for uh, the news. All righty. Then we need to jump into the spoiler-free section of our review for Disney's The Rescuers. Yes. So, The Rescuers was the second film in this series that I saw because I had The Rescuers Down Under on a VHS when I was a kid. Yeah. A bootleg recorded off Disney Channel VHS. Yeah. Not an official VHS. Uh so I had seen, I know I had seen the rescuers. I saw the rescuers after that point when I was a kid. Right. And I remembered parts of the movie, but this movie as a child did not make as big an impression as down under did. Right. Which is fair. So I think that happens. Agreed. Um, I had been looking for to this review for about a year or two now. It's just, I now finally got it on the list. Because I enjoy the rescuers, it's a good, it's an interesting concept for a movie series. Yes, in agreed. my opinion, agreed. Watching it now, I'm not sure the first movie succeeds. Okay, it's not that the movie is bad; it's just no. Nah. It it's an adventure movie that they tried to take a lot of the adventure out, for lack of a better term. Okay. Don't get me wrong, it's still a good movie, but this definitely does, like I said, Rescuers Down Under left a impression. Yes. And every time I watch The Rescuers, I have to, I try to fit it into that impression, and it doesn't fit because they're different movies. I agree. For obvious reasons. Um, I did enjoy the movie. I do think you should watch it. Give it a shot. Absolutely. Um, we do have I do have some issues with some of the animation choices, but uh, it's still a good fun movie. And yeah, I really would suggest watching this before you watch Rescuers Down Under. There is some con. There, well, there's a lot of continuity between the two, even though it's not really required for you to watch this one before the sequel. But if you've got the two movie box, uh, the two movie Blu-ray like I've got. Definitely watch The Rescuers before you watch The Rescuers Down Under. I think it will play better that way because I think if you watch the rest, if you watch it the opposite direction, you'll get disappointed in The Rescuers, like I am. Indeed. Um, and I will admit this is a purely 
uh, opinionated thought on this because I recognize the rescuers is a good movie for what it is. It's just not what I want it to be. And I will admit that right here, right now, because I want it to be like rescuers down under and it isn't. And that's probably the last time I'm intentionally going to mention the rescuers down under in this review, because it would be completely unfair of me to continually compare this to the rescuers down under, because that's not what this movie's trying to be. Yes. Um, but for what it is for a classic styled animated animated Disney movie, mostly in the vein of Robin hood, Mm -hmm. I would say it's really that style of story. Uh, It's, it's good. It's very good. Uh, it's just, it's just not what I wanted. I understood. What are your thoughts? My thoughts, uh, kind of like you, I, uh, my first exposure to the rescuers were rescued down under. Uh, my mom bought us the VHS back in the day, and we watched that, loved it to death, and uh, had the first one or the down under, down under, okay, down under when it came out in like 1990 or that point, 91. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember watching that to death, and I remember the this buzz of all of there was a, there was a there was the prequel to it, and it's like what in the world? So I didn't watch the rescuers until I was an adult. And that was like right. a couple of years ago or but let me rephrase that. I watched the movie a couple of years ago, not saying I didn't become an adult till later, even later in life. Um, but, uh, wait, you're an adult. Nah, <laughs> I'm just a big kid. Like everybody else. <laughs> like I am not just a big kid. <laughs> right. So who has to pretend to be an adult? True. So, uh, I enjoyed the film for what it was. It's it's hard not to do the comparison from the movie you grew up watching to this film you've, you know, later in life watched. And uh, I still really, really enjoy it. It's, it's, I, I like the, it's almost the beginning of, like you said before, like the dark ages of Disney. Yeah. Or what, I, what they the call th- the Bronze Age. One of the things I found out about this is because of the way it lands. This is the last movie before the first dark ages of Disney but really, really before the dark ages of Disney. Cause it's like, after this is like, is when you start getting your lesser known stuff. Yeah. And it doesn't pick back up until the great mouse detective and little mermaid. And ironically, the rescuers Here's down under. under. Well, technically the little mermaid was the movie that brought Disney out of the dark ages. Yes. But in the list, I'm saying in the listing, I should, Said it mentioned all three of these oh, okay. around the time. Yes, it yeah. was Little Mermaid, but I mean these also around at the same time. I agree. Helped with that it was yeah. as it was coming back up. Yeah, agreed. So I would never, in any way, shape, or form, bemoan your favorite Disney princess movie. You may take the fence down. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favorite. Uh, if if, if, if your, no, it's, it's sorry because Tangled does exist. Yes, Tangled does exist. Let me rephrase. Thank classic you. Disney princess. Classic movie. Disney. Yes, because for us, classic is any time before 1995. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, uh, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. But either or, either or, uh, I I found the movie very. It has some re- has some really good points. There's some beautiful animation here, and there's little problems here and there. But overall, I enjoyed the film. And uh, would I recommend it? Yes. Uh, it's it's it was it's from the '70s, so it's gonna have some '70s flair to it. Uh, definitely some '70s style to it. Yes, yeah, some definitely style to it is '70s. The music is very '70s, 70s. very very '70s. Uh, it's so '70s that they planned to get the Carpenters to do the music, but they couldn't get them, so they got somebody who was close. Hmm. You can kind of tell they were aiming for Carpenter style songs in some of these. That is true. Except for the Rescue Aid Society theme. But anyway, <laughs> that's just classic Disney. All right. So, yeah, that was that is my non-spoiler general review of The Rescuers 1977. All right. Well, then we need to jump into the spoiler-free section. Mm-hmm. No. We just did the spoiler-free section. We did. We need to go into the spoiler-filled section of our review for The Rescuers, which we will do... Right after a message from our sponsors. Don't.
don't forget that you can download, download? Don't forget that you can't, uh, don't forget that you can listen to us record the podcast live every Tuesday over on our Facebook page, The Cellcast, our uh, Twitch channel, The Cellcast Gaming, and on YouTube at Cellcast. Also, don't forget to join our Patreon if you would like to support us monetarily. At $1, you'll get our everlasting thanks. At at our $5 tier, you can get some artwork from Jacob. And at our $10 tier, you can get bloopers for every every episode we've released that I've remembered to release them for. And you can get commentaries from different movies. So come check us out over there if you would like to support us financially. Each week on Stunning and Brave, hosts Chris Cowan of the Babylon Bee, and Nate Henderson of Some Boring Budgeting Job confess their privilege, spotlight stunning social media posts, and fabricate outrage, all while keeping you super woke and enlightened. They will make you laugh. That's right, you have no choice. Check out Stunning and Brave at stunningandbrave.net. Do you like Star Wars? I don't just mean the original trilogy. Along with that, I mean the prequels, the sequels, the anthologies, the animated shows, and of course, (laughs) who doesn't like Baby Yoda? Well, if you've been in the fandom for any length of time, you know how toxic the fandom can get. And if you'd like to be able to discuss a galaxy far, far away in a much more positive light, might I suggest searching out The Outer Rim, a Facebook group dedicated to all Star Wars, and check out their YouTube channel, which you can easily find at Pop Americana which the podcast you're currently listening to is also a part of. To find that and more, check out the link in the description. The following is a spoiler-filled review for the movie The Rescuers. Listener discretion is advised. The Rescuers was directed by John Lounsbury, who also directed The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, Wolfgang Reitherman, who also directed The Sword and the Stone, and Art Stevens, who directed The Fox and the Hound. Hmm. It was written by Larry Clemens, Ken Anderson, Frank Thomas, Vance Jerry, David Michener, Ted Berman, Fred Lucky, Bernie Mattinson, and Dick Sebast, hmm. and is based on The Rescuers and Miss Bianca by Marjorie Sharp. Hmm. Or as the movie puts it, Suggested by. Okay. Because it's not really based on either book Hmm. that was out at the time. The cast includes Bob Newhart as uh, Bernard. And uh, he is probably most well known for playing Dr. Robert Bob Hartley on the Bob Newhart show and Dick Loudon in Newhart. But did you know that prior to those things, he was a stand-up comedian? Didn't know that. Indeed. In fact, the run, one of the running gags in this movie is based off of one of his stand-up routines. Really? Yes. He has a routine called the Grace L. Ferguson Airline and Storm Door Company. Oh, okay. In which he talks about one of the worst flights that he ever went on mm. on his way to Hawaii. Okay. Perhaps fictionalized. But it's a common thing in a lot of his stand-ups where he... He doesn't like to fly. He prefers to take trains. And Bernard mentions that that a couple times times. in this movie. (laughs) Can can, can we just take the train? (laughs) Unfortunately, the train will not go to Australia. (laughs) But that's not this movie. Ava Gabor was the voice of Miss Bianca. And she is probably most well known for playing Lisa Douglas on the television series Green Acres. Mm Mm-hmm. Geraldine Page was the voice of Madame Medusa. I'm worried about what that is. He just posted. And and uh, she was Angie Lowe in the John Wayne movie Hondo. Huh. Mm-hmm. I watched that movie once. Joe Flynn was the voice of Mr. Snoops. This was his final role. Okay. Because he died like not long after this. Really? Yes. And uh, he played Dean Higgins in The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes, Mm. a classic live-action Disney movie. Oh, okay. A classic. Classic. It was like one that exists, but you wonder why. Ah, gotcha. (laughs) I did watch it. It's interesting. Mm. 
Jeanette Nolan was the voice of Ellie May. And in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, another John Wayne movie, mm-hmm. she played Nora Erickson. Pat Buttram was the voice of Luke, and he is Mr. Haney in Green Acres. This was the final thing for Jim, not, or not the final, but very close to one of the final productions for Jim Jordan, who was the voice of Orville. Okay. He was most well known for playing a character named Fibber McGee in an old radio drama called Fibber McGee and Molly. Okay. Like pre-television audio drama. Mm. Gotcha. Radio. Radio drama, yeah. Sorry, audio drama is what they call them now. But Mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, John McIntyre was the voice of Rufus, you know, the cat. Yeah. And he played Sheriff Al Chambers in the classic movie Psycho. Really? Yeah. Good movie. Uh, Michelle Stacy was the voice of Penny. Okay. Actual little girl, of course. Yeah. You can definitely tell in the yeah. performance. In the movie Airplane, she was the young girl with coffee. Okay. I've never seen Airplane. I thought you'd seen it already. I ha- I'd be like, I remember watching it when I was a very young kid. I haven't got around to watching it yet. Well, for those who don't know, I'm referring to the character who says, uh, when the little boy offers her coffee, she says, I like coffee like I like my men. Black. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> anyway. Funny. That is funny. Bernard Fox was the voice of the chairman. And in The Mummy, he was Captain Winston Havelock. I believe that's the original Universal movie. Universal. The Mummy. Larry Clemens in a cameo role, because he was one of the writers, okay, was the voice of Gramps in this movie. Okay. And this is his only acting credit. Hmm. Okay. James McDonald was the voice of Evan Rude, Brutus, and Nero. And he is famous for playing Jacques, Gus, and Bruno in Cinderella. Oh, okay. But we don't talk about Bruno. No. Nobody talks about Bruno. George Lindsay was the voice of Rabbit, and in the Andy Griffith show, he played Goober Pyle. Oh. Gomer Pyle's cousin. Oh, okay. He took over when uh, Gomer Pyle went off into the Marine Corps, as seen in Gomer Pyle USMC. Gotcha. I know what you're talking about. I, okay. I've never... Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Bill McMillan... Uh, I only put that this was his only acting credit, so I don't remember who he played. I'm sorry, Bob. Bill, I can't even get your name right. I'm sorry. (laughs) Dub Taylor was the voice of Digger, and he played a saloon old-timer in Back to the Future Part 3. Oh, okay. John Fielder played Owl, and he is the voice of Piglet in The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Okay, so he played Owl in this movie, but he played Piglet. Yes. Okay, just clarify. Two different characters. Oh yeah, I know. Owls, and you can hear it when you're listening to the guy that's like, "That's definitely Piglet." Yeah, agreed. And last but not least, Mel Blanc is in this movie. Really? Yes. You want to make a guess who he plays? Uh, does he play one of the villains? He plays an antagonistic role. Then who does he play? The bats. That Chase Evan Rude. So it is a squeak, squeak, squeak. Yes, that's him. <laughs> that's Bo Blank. Of course, he's known for playing Bugs Bunny and many other Looney Tunes characters. Kingdom Hearts connections. Believe it or not, I have three. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay, do tell. And none of them are Piglet. <laughs> okay. So I kind of expected that one, but that's not the same actor. But anyway. Right. This is definitely some deep connections. I can tell. George Doring who was a musician in this movie. Uh, He was also a musician in Kingdom Hearts 3. Huh. John Pomeroy was a character animator in this movie and was a 2D character artist in, specifically, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Really? Interesting. Probably Cinderella. Okay. The connection there. Probably. I'm guessing. And James Thatcher played the French horn in this movie. And he played the French horn in Kingdom Hearts 3. 
Whoa. Okay. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I know why, because they didn't actually have a symphony orchestra play in the other Kingdom Hearts games besides three, but still. <laughs> interesting. Which is through into my Kingdom Hearts connections. What do you got in info and stuff? All right. So info and stuff on IMDb, it has a score of 6.9 out of 10. Uh, you're able to watch it on Disney Plus if you're subscribed to Disney Plus. Production was Walt Disney Production and distributed by Bona Vista Distribu- Distribution. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, release date, June 22nd, 1977. Box office. It had estimated budget of $7.5 million. That's in 1977 dollars. I mm-hmm. didn't know the conversion now, but it's still a lot. Uh, it had a opening box office of that is pretty good. I'm actually kind of shocked by this number. Uh, two point one million dollars. Oh, okay. Now I'm seeing it. Okay, so this is according to a re-release because they re-release films every four years. Mm-hmm. So in the 1983 re-release of the film at that point it's it's uh it's gross was one uh 2.1 million dollars december 18th 1982 uh it's gross in general around the globe around the world united states canada and the some markets <coughs> was 71.2 million dollars so yeah, it made his budget. It made his budget back like in spades. Yeah, and there again, growing up, I never heard of this film. All I heard was Rescuers Down Under. That was it. Yeah, this so, one not as much. No. Okay, so obviously it does have a sequel, like I said before, uh, the Rescuers Down Under, which was in ni- nineteen ninety. And so that's all I have for an info and stuff. All right, getting into the summary for this movie. In an abandoned riverboat in Devil's Bayou, Louisiana, a young orphan named Penny drops a message in a bottle containing a plea for help into the river. The Rescue Aid Society, an international mouse organization inside the United Nations, finds the bottle when it washes up in New York City. Sure it did. The Hungarian representative, Miss Bianca, volunteers to accept the case and chooses Bernard, a stammering janitor, as her co-agent. The two visit Morningside Orphanage, where Penny lived, and meet an old cat named Rufus. He tells them about a sketchy woman named Madame Medusa, who once tried to lure Penny into her car and may have succeeded in abducting Penny this time. The mice travel to Medusa's pawn shop, where they discover that she and her partner, Mr. Snoops, are on a quest to find the world's largest diamond, the Devil's Eye. The mice learn that Medusa and Snoops are currently at the Devil's Bayou with Penny, whom they have indeed kidnapped and placed under the guard of two trained crocodiles, Brutus and Nero. With the help of an albatross named Orville and a dragonfly named Evanrude, the mice follow Medusa to the bayou. There they learn that Medusa plans to force Penny to enter a small hole that leads down into a pirate's cave where the Devil's Eye is located. Bernard and Bianca find Penny and devise a plan of escape. They send Evanrude to alert the local animals who loathe Medusa, but Evanrude is delayed when he is forced to take shelter from a flock of bats. The following morning, Medusa and Snoops send Penny down into the cave to find the gem. Unbeknownst to Medusa, Bianca and Bernard are hiding in Penny's shirt pocket. The three soon find the devil's eye within a pirate's skull. As Penny pries the mouth open with a sword, the mice push the gem through it, but soon the oceanic tide rises and floods the cave. The three barely manage to retrieve the diamond and escape. Medusa betrays Snoops and hides the diamond in Penny's teddy bear while holding the two of them at gunpoint. When she trips over a cable set as a trap by Bernard and Bianca, Medusa loses the bear and the diamond to Penny, who runs away with them, and the local animals arrive at the riverboat and aid Bernard and Bianca in trapping Brutus and Nero, then set off Mr. Snoop's fireworks to create more chaos. Meanwhile, Penny and the mice commandeer Medusa's swampmobile, a makeshift airboat. Medusa unsuccessfully pursues them, using Brutus and Nero as water skis. As the riverboat sinks from the fireworks damage, Medusa crashes and is left clinging to the boat's smokestacks as Mr. Snoops escapes on a raft and laughs at her, while the irritated Brutus and Nero run on, turn on her and circle below. 
Back in New York City, the Rescue Aid Society watches a news report of how Penny found the Devil's Eye, which had been given to the Smithsonian Institution, and how Penny has been adopted. The meeting is interrupted when Evanard arrives with a call for help, sending Bernard and Bianca off on a new adventure. In the snow. Mm-hmm. So, would you believe there's some irony in us reviewing this movie this week? Why? The film's popularity almost led to a spinoff TV series in 1989. Really? When the animation department greenlit The Rescuers Down Under in 1990, however, the spinoff was reworked into another show. Chip and Dale Rescue Rescue Rangers Rangers. in 1988. I could totally see that now. With Chip and Dale replacing Bernard and Miss Bianca. I can totally see that. Mm -hmm. Minus we wouldn't get Gadget. (laughs) You never know who they could have added from the Rescue Aid Society. That is true. Uh, half, half crazy mouse. <laughs> you could you could easily have a uh, a gadgeteering mouse and a cheese uh, fanatic, fanatic <laughs> Rat. be a part of that society as you know being good mice. And what's the fly's name? Zipper. Zipper. Replace Zipper with Evan Rood, and you got a show. Agreed. <laughs> that is true. I can just see how they. Would have might have reworked characters. It's all yeah, I'm saying. I can see that. Yeah. Penny freezes whenever she gazes into Madame Medusa's eyes. In the Greek myth, those who gazed into a Medusa's eyes turned to stone. Interestingly enough. The Rescue Aid Society honors their founder, Euripides Mouse, who removed a tiny needle from a ferocious lion's paw, a clear reference to the classic Aesop fable, The Mouse and the Lion. Mm-hmm. One of Miss Bianca's traits, as portrayed in the original novel, was her trust and affection for felines, wildly known as menacing predators of mice. The element was brought onto the film in the form of Rufus the Cat. Though he frightens the mice duo initially, he quickly shows he is a friend and is willing to help the mice on their quest to find Penny, with whom he shared a special friendship. Mm. Of course, I also already mentioned why Disney recalled the VHS version of this movie in 1999 due to... An image that appears 28 minutes into the movie. Yes. As Bernard and Bianca fly through the city on the back of an albatross. Mm Mm-hmm. When Miss Bianca's... When Miss Bianca enters the Rescue Aid Society's headquarters, she takes her seat as the delegate representing Hungary. Ava Gabor, who voiced Miss Bianca, was actually born in Budapest, Hungary. Really? Yeah. Many, as I said earlier, many critics and audiences consider this the film that proved that Walt Disney Productions' animation department could survive the death of Walt Disney. It was the company's first major success after The Jungle Book in 1967, and its last until The Great Mouse Detective in 86, The Little Mermaid in 89. Mm. The movie was was also outgrossed strong competition in many European countries. Hmm. While working on the film, Don Bluth, who did, this is one of the movie, Disney mm. movies he worked on, uh-huh. noted that some of the characters did not have the whites of their eyes colored in. When he questioned the reason why, he was told that it was too expensive. Bluth and fellow animator Gary Goldman got their own equipment to test if it was true. They found that it was not too expensive. When they reported back with their discovery, the two were told to follow orders and do as they were told. Bluth later referred to this as the straw that broke the camel's back, which would eventually lead to Bluth and Goldman leaving Disney. Mm -hmm. According to their publisher, The Rescuers, 1977, helped put all nine of British author Marjorie Sharp's The Rescuers novels on the bestsellers list, not just The Rescuers and Miss Bianca on which the film is based. Mm. But contrary to popular belief, Walt Disney was involved in the development of this film, which began in 1962. Disney disliked the idea of the faith of a faithful adaptation of the first uh, rescuer's novel and opted for something closer to Miss Bianca uh, because in the original, uh, the protagonist set off to rescue a Norwegian poet from a gloomy prison. He suggests he instead suggested it be changed to the rescue of a polar bear named Willie from a zoo where he contended with a tyrannical penguin. Following Disney's death, Sharp's second novel was chosen as the primary source for adaptation. I wonder why. Yeah. 
It was around this time that concept artist Ken Anderson toyed with the possibility of reusing the character of Cruella de Vil from 101 Dalmatians. That makes sense. As the main villain. Yeah. To the totally sheer agree. disapproval of some. When attention was brought back to Marjorie Sharp's work, the Diamond Duchess from Miss Bianca became the primary inspiration for the character of Madame Medusa, with early sketches for her design showing similarities to Garth Williams' illustrations from the novel of the character. Milt's call deliberately portrayed Madame Medusa's driving similar to that of DeVille's as a tribute to Mark Davis's work. Mm -hmm. The backgrounds during this scene show a style particularly reminiscent of those in the 1961 film as well. Mm. This was Joe Flynn's final film performance. He's the one who played uh, Mr. Snoops. Mm. Sometime after recording lines for his character, Flynn's lifeless body was discovered by family members in his swimming pool. Mm. He had suffered a heart attack prior to drowning on J July 19, 1974, nearly three years before the film's premiere. As production on the film progressed, the developing storyline suggested that Mr. Snoop's character be expanded. Ultimately, the writers decided to restrain the character to the voiceover work Flynn had been able to provide prior to his death so as to not require a replacement actor. The film's opening sequence was made up of paintings by Mel Shaw, combined with elaborate camera movements to captivate the dramatic feel of the journey of Penny's bottle. The song The Journey is sung from the bottle's perspective, expressing the lifeless object's desperate call for help when lost at sea, rather than Penny's hope of being rescued. This was a first for opening credits in a Walt Disney animated film, as well as, a, as a, the first number sung from the perspective of an inanimate object. Mm. And I think I'm going to skip the rest of these because I one of them I've already mentioned and the other some of these I'm getting a little we're getting a little long in the tooth in this section. So I got gotcha. you. Let's just go ahead and jump to our likes. OK. What is your first like? My first like there there are certain moments of animation in this movie that's just absolutely brilliant because it's they take instead of, you know, taking the shortcut, which they could do, they could take shortcuts. But there are certain moments like with uh, with uh, Bernard, like mm -hmm. Bernard and Bianca, that it's just pure gold to be like you literally you can see their toes move and be like when they move, when they like move or spring or something like that. You see that flex in that toe or you see how their tail whips around something or something like that. It's just pure genius mm -hmm. when it comes to the animation. Now, there's parts in this movie where animation kind of goes, huh? <laughs> but. Uh, there's, there's these brilliant moments of just little animation, like Bernard, he like, he's running and then he has to go back for the, uh, I think the, uh, the umbrella, he has yeah. to go back for it. And you see all that movement mm -hmm. be like, you see him turn on that heel. I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> like this is freaking amazing. There's a lot of that of good animation in this. Oh yeah. It's just, I have some issues with some. Some of the more some of the flourishes in it is where I come into issue with. It. I got we'll you. get to that in a minute. Yeah, yeah. It was just for me. It was like looking at that those little little diamonds of like just pure animation gold in some of those scenes where it's just character movement. It's just so fluid and it has uh, fluid dynamic dynamic dynamic. How am I using the word wrong? Uh, the 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 dynamic of the character movement is so yeah. fluid. And it's just beautiful in so many ways. And like I said before, it'd be like, there's some really, really great animation in this film. And some of it's just like, huh? There again, it was the seventies. Yes. So yeah, that's my first, like, it's just beautiful, dynamic animation. I absolutely, my first like is the fact that I absolutely love the opening title sequence for this movie. Okay. I, I, the, all of those paintings are absolutely beautiful. Oh, completely agree. And the way they are timed with the music mm -hmm. is like, uh, is it, it took my breath away for what yeah. I was watching. It's like, I don't remember this probably because this was not on the VHS I watched because <laughs> it was a bootleg and they probably hit record as soon as it came on and technical problems. And so maybe I saw part of this. Maybe I didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, you know, because you know, stuff happens. But I'm watching this and going, this is drop dead mm -hmm. gorgeous. I really hope this is the style they kind of go through throughout the rest of the film. They don't. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I do get disappointed when we do finally get to New York and we go back to standard animation backgrounds. And it's like, oh, I was enjoying that. And it's not that those backgrounds are bad, mind you, but it's like, for a moment there, I was like, this is gorgeous and I kind of want them to go with it and continue with this. Because it, it kind of had a, an interesting feel, like when you see like the watercolors, yeah, like you see in Oliver and Company and Lilo and Stitch, mm-hmm. where it's like, yeah, it's not realistic, it's not supposed to be, mm-hmm. but it's it gives you that kind of it gives it a, a feel that I thought was interesting and really could help the uh, the film along, and then we just get back to oh yeah, here's the standard animation we've been doing for fifty years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The same kind of animation you saw in Robin Hood. Not that I didn't enjoy Robin Hood or the Aristocats, even though I love the Aristocats. Yeah. But it's the same style. We, You thought we were going somewhere a little more interesting than normal. Nope, we're not. It's like, oh, well. Say la vie. Yeah, exactly. But that opening sequence, even though I don't... I, I, the song does not stick with me. Oh, Even of though I think it's the one that's in the... Um, menus for the blu-ray mm-hmm. but it was just a it really did make you feel like the call her call for help mm-hmm. it even did. though that trivia i read said it was more about the bottle and thinking yeah you're just getting a little too artsy fartsy for that this was her call for help because she was a little lost girl who needed help exactly and it really did make you feel like this is a serious thing. We need to save this girl. Everyone needs to get on board mm-hmm. with this. So it's like, you know, and we're making sure you're aware of how bad this is. And we're showing this journey that I have issues that where this journey goes, but because, okay. No, I'll get into that later. Mm-hmm. It's just, that is an off. I'm just gonna say it's an awful long journey for that bottle to make. And I'm surprised it didn't get picked up in, say, Miami or uh, any of the other major cities along the mm-hmm. eastern United States coast that it got yeah. all the way to New York City before somebody picked it up because mm-hmm. it had to go all the way down the the one, the Gulf side of the Florida Peninsula and then come all the way back up and then go all the way back mm-hmm. up the eastern coast. I'm not sure the currents go that direction. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> so it's like, how did this bottle get to New York? Wouldn't it have been better if someone picked if a mouse picked it up and then sent it some other way, like another movie does? But anyway, <laughs> not to get on my dislikes. I really right. do like this movie. Do not get me wrong. Right. It's just there's some logistical issues that I'll talk about more later. <laughs> Your second like? My second like would actually be the dark, th- the the dark themes in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's it's about a kidnapping. <laughs> it's about a kidnapping a little six year old girl. Yeah, for the simple fact being like, oh, she's small enough to get in this this crevice to find this diamond for this very wicked woman. Yes, and her very cowardly sidekick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> who's afraid of alligators? Which be like to be frank, be like the uh, Brutus and Nero. Are, Fairly intimidating gators. Yes, they <laughs> let's are. just say let's just say that. But the idea this because the like one of the themes when we did Oliver and Company was there again. It was the idea that be like you're you're kidnapping a young child for your own dastardly deeds yes, or something. Your own like nefarious that. reasons. Your own nefarious reasons. And I was just like, wow, you're going there. It's just like that incredible. All right, so yeah, the dark themes in this film are just absolutely incredible because they 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 go places where. Like you're starting to get those those edgier films in the 1970s, yeah, and uh, you get into the 80s where things is like really dark and really heavy, and so you start getting that glimpse of like, okay, we can tell darker and deeper stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to say that uh, Walt Disney had told deep stories before they had, but when you're when you're dealing with a dark issue like kidnapping, you're kidnapping yeah. a child for like you know your you know your own evil evil uh, evil purposes or whatever for your own evil greed and uh, i just found that very fascinating and the fact it's not it's not you know the local police it's not you know the fbi or whatever it's mice Mm -hmm. it's a bunch of mice yeah and i can i can see now where 
with that little bit of trivia where rescuers, the rescuers would have been an animated series, but it got shelved due to becoming rescuers down under. And yeah. then we get Chippendale rescue Rangers. Yeah. Which I can totally see that now. Which that, that oh, be, yeah. That'd be it's like, how did I not put that together yeah. before now? Exactly. So either way, it's like, yeah, it's these dark themes that start to creep into Disney and you get like in, into the eighties where things get really dark. Yeah. And I, I really enjoy when you when you push that envelope, when you push it to you, you don't go like total dark. You don't do, you know, go, go into the, the the adult theme stuff, but you keep you keep within the the child range. But you keep, you go to that. You go to the 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 lip of the abyss mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, your your storytelling, your animation, your whether well, your um, your story beats. You're just going to that edge. See how far you can push it. And I, I love stories like that. Uh, so yeah, it's the 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 darker themes in this movie that's my second like. Okay, my second like is the chemistry between our two leads, Bernard and Bianca. Huh. Because I mean, we we meet Bernard and he's just kind of your plucky handyman. Yeah, they well, call him a janitor. Really, he's more of a handyman he in is. this instance. Um, and everybody knows him, mm-hmm. so it's like you know. And Bianca, I don't know if at this point Bianca loves him or she's just being kind of sweet and thinks, yeah, of all the people, this is the guy who's probably going to help me the most because he's he's not as flirty as some of these other men in this society. <laughs> I see more. I see. I see that point completely. I think she sees more potential in Bernard. His his yeah. willingness to do things. Exactly. He's got more of a pure motive, is what I'm getting yeah. at. And I, that is very much helped with Bob Newhart doing the voice. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and I I love Bob Newhart's dry delivery throughout mm. this whole movie. Oh yeah, um, of nearly every role, but uh, every line. But uh, I just love their chemistry. You perfectly you you see how even though they are obviously from two separate parts of society. Oh yeah you can see how they would be friends, how they would be good working partners. Yeah. And later love well, interests. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I love the, I love the work between these two characters, the, the, the chemistry these two characters have. Oh, okay. And they're a joy to watch. Agreed. Um, so my third dislike, third and final, uh, like, like not third, dislike, like, 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 uh, let me get that right. So mine would definitely go to the scene where we get Penny and her prayer. Be like mm-hmm. that that scene just broke me. I was like, oh my gosh. Be like you you start to feel the gravity of that whole situation. It'd be like her the inescapable escapableness she must feel as a character is like you're this little kid, you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, you can't leave this boat at mm-hmm. all. Yeah. And your only help are two little mice. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> They claim they've got some animals to help them later on, but we'll yep. see that that's one of them's a geriatric turtle, right? And uh, one of them is drunk off his rocker. Yeah, that's that was another thing. I was <laughs> like, oh, okay, they pushed it a little further with the uh, drunk whatever that M- char- mouse, mouse, drunk mouse, I, whatever. That was interesting. A drunk rat, character. Those, okay, those were rats. Let's be honest. Those were, Ellie May and Luke were rats. Yeah, they're rats. They were not rat again, but they were rats. rats. <laughs> Just also, don't, just, just don't call rat again a rat. <laughs> putting this out there, my fan theorizing, I think the rescuers and Great Mouse Detective exist in the same universe. Mm. Just throwing that out there. Okay. So it was the fact that be like uh, Penny is at her bedside. She's praying that to pray for her friends, to pray for the orphanage, to pray for uh, whatever. And yes. she's just that, that breakdown of she, that, that sheer hopelessness she has of be like, she's going to get stuck in that hole and she can't stop it. Yeah. And it was, it was just, I and watched it, that. I'm just like, be like, I want to cry for this character. I know what happens in the end, but it's just that moment of like, sure. It's like, I can't do anything about it. I'm trapped. <laughs> Interesting that you see that. Cause think about it from Penny's point of view. Oh yeah. She is at the lowest she's been. Since oh she yeah. She got kidnapped. Yeah. She's praying for assistance mm-hmm. from God. And God answers her prayer in the form of two mice. Yeah, exactly. 
not the answer she was expecting, but she goes with it because it's like, okay, they're they're talking mice. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you're going to be the ones that let me get out of here? Okay, okay. At least I've got some help. Yeah. Like the idea that God will, God doesn't exactly answer our prayers the way we want yeah. them to, but he answers them the way that he, his desire for our lives to yeah, be. Yeah, that is most beneficial yeah. to the overall, uh, to everything. Yeah. The most beneficial for everyone involved. Yeah. Uh, even if we can't see it. And you have to imagine if you were waiting for someone to rescue you, and the only things people things that come are two mice. Uh-huh. You know, there's just going to be a thought that crosses your mind. It's like, how is this going to work? Yeah. Because I can't see it. Yeah. But the thing is, sometimes you just have to have faith in what you're presented with, and she does. Yeah, she just she's she, got the most faith I think of any Disney character I, in. I would in, agree. It's been made. So. She she literally has that blind faith to believe that. Yeah. Be like something good is going to come out of this. Yeah. And be like, even though be like all like you said before, she's at her lowest point. Yeah. As a character, and then you be like, her prayer is answered in a way via. Uh, Bianca and uh, Bernard, mm-hmm. and it's just be like it's very sweet because you, you see you see a character at her lowest, and you see her her desperation in knowing that she can't get out of it by yeah. herself. She's impossible to get out of it, mm-hmm. and the, the same way that we know that we can't escape our our own sin, our own depravity without Christ. Yes, and so if we rely on Christ for our strength and our salvation. And everything, which is, I know it's hard for a lot of us to, you know, just, you know, put our trust fully into everything because we have everything in the world coming at us. So it's just that the idea of uh, having the faith of a child to uh, believe. So I just had an interesting thought. What's that? There is another Disney movie in which a little girl prays to God for relief Mm. of sorts. And is given an unexpected answer. Really? And he's sitting right in front of you. Oh. Lilo. Lilo, yeah. So I, I totally get that. I so, totally see that now. So here's my here's here's what I wish we would have seen. You remember those trailers where Stitch interrupted oh, all yeah. All those oh, classic yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney moments? Yeah. What if he's the one that showed up instead of Bernard and Bianca? Oh my gosh! <laughs> It's like, ah! <laughs> Aloha! <laughs> oh, I want to see somebody do that. Oh, my God. Disney, get on that. I don't care that The Rescuers is not as popular as other movies, franchises. <laughs> I want to see Stitch give Madame Medusa and Mr. Snoops what for. <laughs> Good night. He'll kill Nero and Brutus. <laughs> They they will run with their they tails. Will not, they will they run. Will not survive. <laughs> Stitch comes to <laughs> Penny's rescue. Oh crap! We're be, doomed. <laughs> I want to see this. I really want to see this. Oh my gosh! Okay, yeah. All right. That brings me to my <sighs> final like. Yeah. And that is the character of Evan Rude. Oh okay. This is like the most. <laughs> He's a background character. Yeah. He is there almost as a utilitarian character. I agree. He's just there so that Bernard and Bianca can get across the swamp to the to the uh to the boat. Mm-hmm. He goes back there as a messenger to the other animals, and then he gets helps get those other animals to the boat, and he shows up at the end, somehow flying from what's apparently supposed to be Louisiana. To New York City to deliver this message of another child who needs help and rescuing. I'm just saying that's a long distance. That's a lot for of logistics. For a dragonfly. Yeah. But this little guy, despite being he's not he's an important character, but any person could he's a sight gag. Yeah. This pretty character much. is a sight gag. Pretty because much. Because He's named after an out the man. He, hey, he's named after the man who invented the outboard motor, motor and he is an this outboard, outboard motor. motor. <laughs> so that means even if the kids didn't know he's named after 
the man who built the out invented mm-hmm. the outboard motor. They probably at least know that there is a there are boats with motors on the back with the words Evan Rood on it. Mm-hmm. At least. So it's a joke. This character is supposed to be a joke, and I love him. <laughs> okay. He is, I mean, you think about it, he's probably he's probably braver than Bernard and Bianca are because he has to keep from getting killed eaten by bats. True. Who really do want to eat him. And I'm thinking <laughs> Mel Blank bats. <laughs> yeah, Mel Blank bats. <laughs> Good night. You think if those bats had the intelligence of Bugs Bunny. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my word. Uh, but this little guy, Evan Rood, is like the guy who doesn't quit. Mm-hmm. He has... I mean, I do have to question why he didn't leave during the day when the bats would have been asleep. But... <laughs> True. But he does get back there, and he's... He's a... A, a, a good... A, a persistent little snot. Okay. And I like him for that. So yeah, Evan Rude is my third like for this movie. Alrighty. Which brings us to our dislikes. Yes. So uh what is your first dislike my for first... the rescuers? Uh my dislike, my first dislike is that stinking rocket boat. <laughs> The, you the, don't the, like the swamp mobile? No, I don't like the swamp mobile. The swamp jet ski? Yeah, that pretty much. Dates jet uh, water bikes? Yeah, pretty much. I think the jet ski actually existed at that point, but I it don't did. know. If, I don't know if water bikes existed at that point. It's like, well, it's more like like I understand this is there, a cartoon. This how is a cartoon funny would swamp. it be if the swamp mobile was the inspiration for the water bike? That would be weird. So, just like logistically. But okay, Medusa has this jet powered whatever it is. <laughs> it's I don't even agree with that description I read of the Swamp Mobile yeah. in the summary where it said it was a airboat that had been modified. That's not an airboat. That is not an airboat. I've seen airboats. That is not an airboat. <laughs> that, yeah, it's, it's an amalgamation of something. It, it is definitely a bodge of about four different types of vehicles one of them was an a a, a, a model a ford mm-hmm. i can mm-hmm. tell you that but it's like uh, that is an interesting contraption i agree like the design wise it's an interesting design but when you're making this a swamp boat it's like how does that have a swamp boat <laughs> it's just it'd be like the design just makes no sense for it like don't get me wrong, be like to design it very well, but to design it as a like a, a jet-powered sled is just like it's just baffling. It's just like, shouldn't that have a fan in the back? Like rotor or something, you can move this thing. Like she's flying around like it's just like got it's just like <laughs> logistically it drove me nuts it's like how in the world is this thing even going it's just pushing her and she has no control over it but she has control over it logistics people she had a steering wheel yeah but where are the rotors in order to turn that thing under the flames probably (laughs) probably (laughs) there again that's a nitpick beyond belief about this admittedly you never see where that exhaust thing move at all so you don't but there again let's logistically it's it's a kid's cartoon it's a cool design but like logistically it's like how does this thing work either or that's nitpick so what is your number two okay interesting note i just looked this up the stand-up jet ski or Mm. as they're actually called personal watercraft yes Invented by Kawasaki mm-hmm. under the jet ski brand, 1972. Okay, so they would have just been in production when this movie oh, was in. Stand up. I can't. I have not found the sit down version yet. Yeah, I'm sure it's in here. But this would have been, if nothing else, they were inspired from the yeah. Swamp Mobile from these things. Yeah. So, yeah, just throwing that out there. Interesting. They're still presuming more poppers on sit down variety. Okay, it doesn't say when those are invented. So never mind. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Interesting. So yeah, mine would be the logistics of the swamp buggy. Swamp mobile. Swamp mobile buggy, whatever. It's supposed to be in Louisiana. So I buggy. have doubts. <laughs> Oh, and I, I, and I now I'm gonna agree. and now I'm jumping on this instead of what I, my actual first dislike okay. was. Let's talk about logistics. Okay. Because here's problem A. Despite if this is 
no matter even if this is a much closer swamp to New York City than Louisiana, mm. this is a small adventure. Yeah, this is not an ep- the epic adventure it feels like it should be. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's uh, there is a transitionary scene between New York City and Devil's Bayou. Oh yeah, but it's like it is over the course of a song, and you don't really get the sense of travel. Yeah. It doesn't even really feel like it took more than a, bur- a uh, night, uh, just a, a night trip. Yeah. Which I don't know how far an albatross can fly at night, but I suspect not all the way to southern Louisiana. Right. I just suspect. Uh, but on the other hand, the other issue, main issue I have with this is I still don't think that's in southern Louisiana. <laughs> I don't know where Devil's Bayou is, but that's just a little bit of a far distance for this to take place. Even though, obviously, they're going for Cajun stereotypes once you get down there. And plus, if you're going to kidnap a little girl to go down into a a a, a hole where you think he pirates... Uh, cave might be which admittedly i know there were pirates down mm-hmm. there around new orleans and those bayous so i understand i get that part of it but why wouldn't you kidnap a girl who might be a little more rugged and not a city girl who's been and i get orphanage don't yeah. get me wrong because like the thought process who's going to miss the orphan i'm thinking there might be some orphans a little closer to where you are since you're keeping her out in the middle of the swamp anyway, yep. where people can't get to her. It's just some logistical issues to the whole thing. And it's because of these logistical issues, this movie feels less epic than it should, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Because this should be, an, it's called The Rescuers. Yeah, It should be this big event where we're going down here and we're going to rescue this girl. And admittedly, this is part of my problem, because that's what we got in the sequel. True. Is we got this big adventure across who knows how many miles for them to save Cody in the sequel. Mm-hmm. And this little girl gets like, it really feels like they made an overnight trip to find her. Right. And then they get back and, of course, everything ends on a happy note where she even gets adopted at the end. Don't mm. get me wrong. Like the ending. Right. But it's just like, it. this This feels about as it takes up the same amount of space that Robin Hood's land area might be. Okay. It's, it's in that large a setting. It's, yeah, Robin Hood, Disney's Robin Hood does take place in Nottingham in that mm. area, which is... You know what, an area the size of Cherokee County where we live? Possibly. Possibly. This is supposed to feel like half the movie is taking place in New York City and half the movie is taking place in a a fictional bayou in southern Louisiana. And this really feels like you could have driven there. Yeah. Because guess who drives there? Medusa. Yeah. Drives there in apparently one night and she apparently is not worried about the fact she lost all her luggage. Hmm. All right, so I did do the uh, the calculations mm-hmm. uh, to drive from Louis. Or I just pulled it up on Google. Yes, uh, to drive from. Now, Grant, this is modern twenty first century two thousand twenty two twenty two. Right, to drive from Louisiana to New York in general would take you twenty twenty one hours and fourteen minutes. To yeah. fl- to fly from New- from that same area. It would take uh, two hours and four, fifty-four minutes by jet. Which, by jet, which the albatross is most decidedly not. Not. It's feather powered. <laughs> it's, yeah, and he's going to take breaks. So I'm still saying there is no way Devil's Bayou is in Louisiana. It is at best in Virginia. At best. <laughs> And I'm not saying the pirates never came to Virginia. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's not where you think pirate treasure is going to be. Right. 
But, oh my gosh, yeah. Well, Geek Devotions, who happens to be in our chat, says, what if it was Florida? I still don't think that's far enough. Because it's not just how quickly they get there. It's how quickly that bottle oh, yeah. got from where she dropped it off and somehow got to New York, which I'm still convinced the ocean currents do not go that direction. Yeah. I'm fairly certain it would have gone all the way around the Atlantic before it got back to New York City. Yeah, legitimately, it would, ha- it would literally have to go around either the, the Cape of uh, South America or go around Florida, which the, the Gulf doesn't do that. Okay, Geek Devotion says it, they said it was on the coast of the Atlantic. I don't remember that, but here's the, my issue. The stereotypes of the characters shown are very Cajun. Yes. Very Cajun. They even if I know the Florida people are can be just as or if not worse <laughs> than some of the people you find you, 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 the stereotype of the people found in you know the the swamps of Louisiana, but uh, and even if it's Florida, I kind of question that it could it could be either it's possible. It, there's a possibility it could be South Carolina or North Carolina. Uh, yeah, I mean I can see that for. Bernard and Bianca and Medusa's trip. The bottle is still a problem. Yeah. The bottle will always be a problem. Oh, I agree. Because there's no way that bottle, admittedly, we don't know how long it took the bottle to get up there, but it was still fairly quick enough time. Yeah. Because we're just hearing about Snoop's finding out she was finding her dropping those bottles into the swamp. Uh, early on in the uh, like when Bernard and Bianca first get to the pawn shop, so right, and you still they said it was what six months from when she got kidnapped. Yeah, six months. Okay, I can maybe see that amount of time. Yeah, but eh, still. Anyway, I'm getting off yeah. on a tangent. There's just some logistical issues I have with where they're saying Devil's Bayou is, or where yeah. it feels like they're saying Devil's Bayou is. That just doesn't feel. Like it works and it's probably something I should just let go. (laughs) Yeah. But you just can't hold it back anymore. (laughs) Remember how I said it's unfair to judge this with down under. Yeah. That's part of my issue is I still no matter even now (laughs) I'm judging it to down under. Right. And down under handles this distance far better than this movie does. Agreed. Anyway. Yeah, I would go in the, the exact same vein. And my number two is the the logist the 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 way of travel this bottle takes. Now, granted, we 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 really don't know its 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 path. Be like no, it's we it's, don't. it's it's the assumption that it somehow got onto the Atlant- the Atlantic coast and just floated. I mean, like, it could have gone through rivers. It could have gone through basins. Uh, we and just we do don't see it in the ocean for a lot of that trip, right? And we do see it getting like pushed around by ships and such, mm-hmm. but still, yeah, it's just like th- there's a lot in this movie that are like legit, legit, legitimate uh, logistics are just kind of be like thrown out there. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, this is how this works. But there again, it's now, it's, it's admittedly it's, you're it's, not supposed to think about it this hard. Yeah, it's 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 animation magic. It's movie magic. So just you're supposed to say, okay, you just got to flow with it. We we need a reason. For the rescuers to find out about the little girl, we need her to be to to be close enough. Her her original the orphan should be close enough to where the mice are at the beginning of the movie, so they can go find they can easily find where where to go. Yeah, and find out it's in Devil's Bayou, and then we just need to get to Devil's Bayou. Yeah, because whatever that, Devil's Bayou is. Yeah, because that's the thing. Be like they You're find supposed to accept that. Yeah. The bottle got to New York, and then Bianca and Bernard got to Devil's Bayou. Yeah. So the idea that uh, Penny's orphanage is in New York. Yes. They kidnapped her in New York. York. And then brought her all the way down to Mm. where? At at best, Florida. Let's say Florida. At best, Florida. Because I at least have heard of bayous in Florida. Yeah. There's probably bayous up and down the East Coast, but I yeah. the Atlantic Coast, but I don't know that much. Yeah, but the 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 way the story is told and how they betray the area, it seems like it's like like uh, Louisiana, Louisiana. No, that, no summary, that summary I read said Louisiana. Yeah, 
So it's like there's a reason I could uh, there's a reasonable assumption anyone would make that they mean for her to be in Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Just like yeah. <laughs> logistically, this movie's a headache. <laughs> Which is, in a lot of ways, you're just not supposed to think about it this hard, but, but as, we do. But as reviewers, you do. I, I don't know if it's reviewers. I think we do because we look at this thing and we think we were trying to think deeply about how much we like or dislike this movie. And both of us have an interest in logistics. Yes. And so we latch onto this. Okay. How did this bottle get here? And how did the mice get down there? And does this make sense? Despite the fact in the grand scheme of things, none of that matters. It just matters that they happened. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. So, yes, that is my my Your second dislike. Second dislike? Yes. Uh, my second dislike. I am not a fan of the sketchiness of some of the animation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this. You brought up a lot of good points about uh, movement. Oh, yeah. And, such. and to some degree, I, you, I think you do lose some of that detail in the inking stage and in the, uh, a lot of times, uh, well, at least that's what we sometimes yeah. see. So I think I understand why the sketchiness is there, mm -hmm. but man, does it distract me throughout oh, yeah. the film? Yeah. But also think about this be like when they did one or one Dalmatians, they switched over from doing hand ink to doing scans. Yeah. So every frame, every cell is, is scanned in. So like all of the imperfections that were not erased before the scanning uh -huh. are on the plate. Yeah. So like it, it gives it more like the, the, you, you still get the, uh, the, uh, the framing of the character. At one point you do see like Penny, like her entire phrase structure yeah at one in like two frames i'm like okay that's different but like, it's not different but it was the time period in which disney was doing that yeah and it was and i was, was reading something I, I think this may have been later on in that trivia that i yeah. skipped over but uh, someone brought that up and they said that sketch that they they wanted to leave the art as untouched from the sketches as possible mm. and i'm thinking you could do a little bit of cleanup Make they have lines, cleanup artists for a reason. Make these lines, you know, just a little bit nicer. You could still keep this kind of fluid, sketchy, this feeling without, you know, seeing construction lines. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, be like, that was Disney's approach at the time. It's, it's a, Yeah, I, I, and I get that. That's It's understandable. You see the same kind of thinking in a lot of the movies from this time period of mm -hmm. Disney. I mean... It does not really get better until you get to like, uh, well, the Black Cauldron is, a, is yeah. the best example. That's really where uh, the more modern Disney art style really gets, really starts to transition over to yeah. from the old style to the to the modern style. Mm -hmm. at, at least I assume that's where it is. There's still a couple of yeah. movies right before that. I'm not, they may have started that there in the '80s, but uh, I mean it's it's purely good by the time you get to down under right i hate bringing this, this movie up so often but uh because like what are we reviewing the rescuers or the rescuers down under well <laughs> <laughs> but the sketchiness is just like it makes it hard to tell what's an animation error and what isn't not because it's uh making it harder to see the errors yeah but because it's making it harder to see what's not an error right i mean i read that part in the trivia about with don bluth where he said they noticed the eyes weren't colored in mm -hmm. that's not true throughout the whole film there are plenty of spots there where on every character the eyes are the whites of the eyes are colored incorrectly yeah but there's a lot of shots where it isn't yeah and Sometimes you look at that and you really can't tell if it's intentional or not. Yeah. And it's not like it's being done in action scenes to give more feeling of movement mm -hmm. where that makes sense. A lot of times it's just, you know, a standard conversation scene. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Bernard, what happened to your corneas? <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> but anyway. Mm. All right. So my third dislike is about this whole uh, devil's eye problem. Okay, so here, let me explain for a moment. 
Okay, so Penny is a to to quote a a, a, t, uh, a series we were watching at Bible study at one point. It's against my will. Uh, we are the only people who will get this reference. I know, I know, because I don't know how many other people saw Rune Knight. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Still a good series. Good series. I need to good finish it. Yes, but okay, so. She she finds the diamond. It's the whole uh, basis of the story is that uh, Medusa must find the diamond in order for she to become filthy rich. And she's so obsessed with it, she won't take any other diamond, even though there's millions of diamonds down there. Right. But uh, so to get the diamond, Medusa trying to keep it away from her henchmen, like stuffs this like massive diamond inside uh, Penny's teddy bear. <laughs> Which I'm like, okay, one, how do you stuff it in the bear? Like, do you cut the bear open and sew it back up? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. In the midst of different frames, but either way. So, well, apparently there was a cut scene where you see her doing that. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that would be nice to see. But, so, and then, we, you know, we get the we get the happily, happy ever after scene where uh, uh, Penny is adopted and... And the the devil's eye diamond is in the Smithsonian. Yeah, it it's belonged like, in a museum. Apparently, yeah, exactly. What are you, Doctor Jones here? <laughs> but at the same time, it's like okay, so Penny gets nothing for you know. She literally just gives this diamond away. The, she got adopted. I. It's like seriously, I mean, like it's now. It's keep a, in mind, she got adopted after. Probably after the news broke that she was that this girl had been kidnapped from the orphanage, but while she was gone, she happened to find like the most expensive diamond in the world that this evil woman forced her to search for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would make you so. I mean, that adopted gonna, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, it's like you just became famous. Uh huh. <laughs> it's like come here, little it's girl. It's not a bad reason to get adopted. Do no, you know, get me. No, right? it's not. It's yeah, not. Adoption is always a cool thing. But period. I've, I've got friends who were adopted when yeah. they were young. But uh, at the same time, I'm like, wait a minute. It's okay. So I'm just saying it was a foregone conclusion at that point that it would happen. Yeah, it would happen. She would get adopted. But she's not given any kind of reward for finding it or anything. It's like, oh, we just get the most most prized value diamond in the world. And she the person who got, found it got nothing. She probably got a personalized tour of the Smithsonian. Got to see all the cool things. Uh. <laughs> At least give her, get her it's a. The government uh, in the seventies, where she's lucky she got anything. That is true, because she would have been taxed the cost of the diamond. That's what it was, taxation. Ugh. She got away without having to pay the taxes by donating it to the Smithsonian. Uh, go figure. And plus, she's a she's a six year old. She doesn't know anything about this. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm just like many of my libertarian friends do tell me that taxation is theft. But anyway, anyways, so it's just the, the idea, like they could have like given her like a savings bond that had a lot of money in it that she yeah, can open like up when she's older. Ward? Yeah. For exactly. finding this thing? Yeah. Finding this cultural artifact? Uh, now, in all honesty, they probably did give her, the Smithsonian probably did pay for it. It wasn't a full donation. Yeah, it had to be. <laughs> And probably some of that went towards the co uh, cost of her adoption. Some of that's probably sitting in a trust uh -huh. that is being controlled by her adopted parents. Right. As her legal guardians. Yes. We didn't go into all that because... There again, we're ending the movie. It's not important for the movie. <laughs> it's mostly like, here's our happy ending. We need to hit on all five, all the points. We can say, yeah. yeah. We got... Uh, Penny got back to New York. She got back to the orphanage. Uh... She got adopted and all this other stuff. And like, ding, 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 ding. We got to hit, go down the checklist. Mm -hmm. Oh, agreed. Because we've got three minutes until the movie ends. So yeah. we just got to plow through this whole thing. And oh, yeah, some little mice helped me. It's like, did you, no one talk to you about your story when you go on television? <laughs> Probably don't talk about the talking mice. mice? <laughs> I, I, I can, I can just see like Penny, you know, is growing up and she learns about her trust and like, tw you know, she's, you know, she, she's rich. She's rich beyond her leads. Like, oh my gosh, where's this been my entire life? I'm 18 years old. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. But anyway. Anyways, I just feel like that was just more like, really? I mean, like, Penny got nothing? Oh, she got adopted. 
and it went to the museum. Yay, it went to the museum. Yay, she got adopted. Yay. But at the same time, be like, shouldn't she get something besides getting adopted? <laughs> Being adopted is its own reward. I, I, I Especially when you've lived in it. Think about it. What did she probably want more than anything else? She didn't care about that diamond. No, she didn't. She the, hated that diamond. There again, she's six. Completely, yes. I get it. Yes. But logistics. <laughs> you want to get into logistics? It's my turn. Okay, it is fine. my flipping turn. Because okay, what I it. the thing I dislike the most about this movie is discount Cruella de Vil. Because that's what she is. Pretty much. She is this. She is. She is not the. Emily Cruella Deville is not that deep a villain. She just wants to kill puppies to make a coat, which killing puppies is bad enough. Evil as a woman. As a cat lover, I say killing puppies is not something you should do just to make a coat. Right. You really shouldn't kill puppies anyway. But True. Even to make a coat. But besides the point. Um. The thing is, Cruella de Vil, despite having one of the best villain songs... Oh, yeah. Uh, ...is probably... I get why you might you might uh, mimic the character with, oh, yeah. when you need a villain. And you especially when you want to make a dastardly villain, you just want to hate. The problem is, a good villain is not just a character you hate... It's a character you love to hate. hate. You look at Scar. You look at Jafar. You look at Gaston. You look at Cruella de Vil. You look at Maleficent. Mm -hmm. You look at the evil queen. Mm -hmm. You hate them, but you love to hate them. Oh, yeah. Madame Medusa, you if, just hate. Or just like, you man. Think, you watch it go... For one thing, she's not, uh, despite the fact she's a very cruel person. Yeah, she is. She's not really that villainous. She wants this one diamond. Bad enough. She's willing to kidnap a girl to get it. Okay, that's, that's terrible. You're getting there. You're getting there. This girl, despite the fact you can't get this one diamond and you really want this one diamond, this girl has brought up and has reported to you many times that there's still a ton more of a ton of priceless jewels mm -hmm. down here. You own a pawn shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may not like these things. You may really want this one diamond. Her obsession. You yeah. have time. Mm -hmm. You have everything on your side. All you've got to do is sell these jewels and you don't have to tell anybody where they came from. Exactly. It's like, oh yeah, we found these jewels down in the bayou, down in this pirate's chest. And we we're not selling them all at once, because you know that would be that wouldn't be very wise. We are, have our own monetary system. We want to make sure, you know, we're set, you know. Yeah. We're selling stuff as time comes up. And all this time you're still sending this little girl down there to get the diamond. Now, admittedly, the girl's trying to escape and this one diamond is what you think will set you, set her up for life. But here's a wild idea. Why don't you start, I don't know, find, use that swamp mobile of yours to kind of dislodge some of that area so she can get, someone else can get back up in there where that is. Cause it's obviously going to, if she hadn't found it by now, it's obviously a spot that's not easy to get to or that she's too scared to get to. And here's a wild idea. Don't kill your only cre your only person you got that can get down there who you don't have to, so you don't have to go kidnap another somebody else. Yeah. Because you already got an asset who's already working for you, you've already made work for you and is still willing to go down in there. Why am I giving tips to villains is what I would <laughs> like to know. It's like I've thought this out. I really have it. I'm bringing this up off the top of my head. Yeah. I am not a kidnapper. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> No, but it's like, this villain is so dumb mm -hmm. that you can't even hate her very well. I would agree. But like she's, she's more comedic. For, these are two bumbling villains. Yeah. I do not, for an, for an epic adventure that's something called the Rescuers should be, Yeah, I don't want bumbling villains. I want villains I'm going to go and look at, ooh, I hate you, but I love that I hate you. Yeah. You should... That's what you should be going for. 
Shere Khan does a much better role at this. King Candy does a much better mm-hmm. job at this. Hans from Frozen is better than this. <laughs> yeah, because we to to relate the what you're stupid lamb villain from Zootopia is a better villain than these people. <laughs> That's true because we we do find we get invested in who they are and their their schemes and all that. But with uh, Medusa and her henchmen, it's just more like, okay, you're bad people. You want to do yeah. evil things, but at the same time, be like you're not an interesting villain. It's the same problem you have with the uh, the gang boss in Oliver and Company. Yeah, they're not memorable. Yeah, the only reason I know of Madame Medusa from being in my memory. It's because you obviously made her Cruella de Vil, but you didn't make her, you didn't do any of the good parts of Cruella de Vil to make her. Yeah. You didn't make the villain memorable. Mm -hmm. And I remember this because it's like, oh, I remember the rescuers down under. I should watch the rescuers. Oh, yes, this person. Mm -hmm. And fat weird Al Yankovic as her, as her, Mm -hmm. as her, uh, toady. I'm sorry. That's the, my first thought that comes to my mind when I see this guy. Is he looks we're, like we're, we're, like fat weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> yeah, agreed. But anyway, that's my third and final dislike. We need to rate this movie. Yes, we do. We already know that Josh is giving it a four point five. Wow, which is a raise from what he current was giving it last week. Wow, which was zero. Wow. I don't think either one of those is actually accurate for my taste because I'm going to give it a six. Give it a six? Okay. I'm giving it a six. It's not my favorite yeah. movie. It's not the worst movie I've seen. It's got oh, so, so much potential that they make up in the sequel. Uh, <laughs> I hate to bring. I've re- I, I, I said I wasn't going to bring up Rescuers Down Under, and I kept doing it. I'm sorry. I apologize. It is you much, just you just can't help it. It's a much better movie. Agreed. <laughs> but and a much better villain, if we're being honest. Agreed. I mean, what do you He's expect? more memorable. What do you expect? It's George C. Scott. <laughs> True. But anyway, Rescuers. I'm giving a six out of ten. It's not horrible. It's setting it, it sets up the relationship with Bernard and Bianca, mm-hmm. which is the primary reason I would suggest watching this. And why it's just watching and, and it's why it's just watching this before you watch Down Under. Because if you watch it in the opposite order, you're just gonna be disappointed with this movie. Yeah. Or like the both of us watching Rescuers Down Under before. Because, because that's what was on t- TV at the exactly. time. Exactly. So for me, um, I might give it a little bit higher, probably more like a seven because you have these brilliant moments throughout this film and you have beautiful animation. You have uh, great setups in the whole bit, but there's a lot of where things just kind of drop, but like the animation drops a little bit here and there and your, your motivations and your logistics in this film just become a headache mm-hmm. and your, your villain is not memorable. Uh, neither one are. They're just bumbling fools. They're like, yes, they do evil, wicked things, but they're they're not memorable. They're not the character that you think of. Oh, I think it was Scar, who's a memorable character that you yes. love and hate. Ursula. Ursula. Yeah. Gaston. Some of them. <laughs> uh, Scar. I, we said Scar. Yeah, we did. Uh, Isma. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think who the the name of the villain in Pocahontas. I can't remember that guy's name. Captain either or. The governor. The governor. Whatever his name was. Yeah, either or. It's just the fact that like the... Heck, the Heffalumps and Woozles were better villains than Madame Medusa. <laughs> Agree. They're just, they're, they're not memorable at all. And uh, uh, the, I, I'm trying, there again, like Drew, trying not to do the comparison between the two. But Honest John from Pinocchio was a better villain than oh, Madame Medusa. Oh my gosh, you are completely right. It's like yes, Medusa does some wick, you know, some evil things, but it's just not a memorable character. Yeah, they're 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 more they're more known for their acts more than their character. The, the problem with this movie, if the biggest, if you're gonna boil all the issues down to one movie, is that this movie just is not epic. Like, no, it's it it's not B. Yeah, it should be epic or scale. More accurately, like I want it to be. Yes, but it's not. 
it'd be like the, the movie drags in so many places, even though it'd be like there's brilliant animation throughout the film, yeah. but it's just like the, the story, the story itself drags and you have non memorable characters and now, it's I, just, it's just, I, it's a bland movie in a lot of ways, but it has all these little two. It has diamonds in the rough that are very good. Literally, literally diamonds everywhere. You know, diamonds are forever. Diamonds are a girl's best friends. Whatever. If I could have had a fourth leg, I do want to mention this. Mm. The scene in the pipe organ. Oh, yeah. That was that, was, uh, that is probably the most memorable thing of this movie. Oh, yeah. To me. Is the alligators playing, uh, trying to get Bernard and Bianca out of this pipe organ. And playing pretty good, I might add. <laughs> to get them out of here. And you're sitting there. And, and it's right around the time you think, shouldn't... Snoop, I know I called him Snoodly. Snoodly. Snoops or Medusa. It's like figure out, find out why the organ is being played. At least then they bring out Medusa. It's like, why didn't you come out here sooner? Mm -hmm. And then she's like, Oh no, it's mice! You're in a swamp. You're lucky it's only (laughs) mice. (laughs) Could have been a python. A water moccasin. <laughs> Something. <laughs> a gator who's not Nero or Brutus. <laughs> that is true. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I give I give it a I give it a seven. It's got it's a movie that's got problems, but it has all these beautiful diamonds in it and great care, you know, some great characters and great moments, and it's worth a watch. And definitely, if you've never seen it, go watch it. It's it's a Indeed. lot of fun. Uh, so yeah. All right, and that brings us to the end of another episode. And you know what I have not done? What's that? Looked up what the next movie is. The next movie we are watching is, and, I, and that also means I haven't done the trivia for it yet. No, you haven't. Uh, so I will pull up what movie we are doing next. Oh, this is ironic. The Chipmunk Adventure. Yes, we are. <laughs> From 1987. Seven. Yes. Uh, let me look up some trivia right Oh, my gosh. This. So, yeah. This we, is Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yes, Alvin Chris. and the Chipmunks. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Because I remember watching this, I believe, over at my grandparents when I was a very young child. And it's like, whoa, this is interesting. <laughs> And it, it's it's somewhere. it's it's not your not the modern Alvin and the Chipmunks. It's the the Chipmunks from the nineteen eighties, in which like Alvin and the Chipmunks became you know the the global phenomenon they are. Yes, that movie. Yes. Oh my gosh! But this is a movie full of songs the entire bit because that's what Alvin and the Chipmunks is about uh-huh. music, and uh, if you. If you don't like squeaking, there's a lot of squeaking. <laughs> but yeah, that is the next movie we were reviewing is the Chipmunk Adventure from 1987. Am I right? 87, yes. That's 87, what it says. all right. I'm trying to find where you can watch this movie. <laughs> that's a good question because I'm going to need to know that before next Thursday. Right. Okay. There are two songs in this movie that are sung by a character named Mrs. M- Miss Miller. Mm-hmm. Both of these songs were written by the creator of the Chipmunks and the father of the writer, producer, and star. Okay. And I want to know one of the names of the songs. Okay. So, yeah, that's going to be the trivia question. I will put that out later this week. So, uh, in the meantime, I guess that's going to be it for us. Yes. Do you have anything to say before we hit the uh, outro? Uh Man, this has been an interesting year already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess this has been Drew. This is Jacob. And we will catch you in the next frame. You can follow Jacob on his Facebook at Jacob B. Heron. His Facebook page, Jacob's Daily Art Corner, where he tries to draw each and every day. His Instagram at Jacob B. Heron. His Twitter at Jacob Heron. And his letterbox at Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen. His Facebook page Drew's photo bin to see his photography. His letterboxed page at GGeorge759. His Twitter at GGeorge759. And Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at The Cellcast Podcast. On Twitch at The Cellcast Gaming. On YouTube at Cellcast. 
on Twitter at cast underscore cell. The Cell Cast can be found at Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us, and also on Podchaser. Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell, with a single L. Oh, 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 o